Welcome to the Women Action Takers podcast, where we bring you uplifting, inspirational, and motivational action takers who are making a positive impact on the planet. I'm your hostess, Linda Sunshine West of Living Live. My passion is to help driven women entrepreneurs gain confidence to ask for their worth, clarity to attract clients to them, and focus to get faster results. My motto is be seen, be known. This podcast, as well as everything I do, is born out of that motto. Hey, let's take action now and get on with the show. Let's hear it for Forbes Riley. Woo! She's <laughs> I'm so excited to have you because, you know, of action takers, really, you are an amazing action taker. And we were just talking about something, talking about starters versus finishers and how important they are in our lives, right? That we need starters, we need finishers. But, you know, Forbes, why don't you share with us, like, what is one thing that really, really got you started at the very beginning? Because you just do some amazing things. I'm working on like my eighth book at the moment. And I was writing since four o'clock this morning. And I found myself actually revealing something very personal to myself about how geeky and awkward I was as a little girl. And not a joke. Uh, and it was in the privacy of my own house. I wasn't on stage talking to anybody. I, you know, I actually found myself saying I was qualified as a genius when I was a kid. But I had a broken nose and frizzy hair and I was overweight and I was awkward and I didn't have a lot of friends. Because when you are that smart, it's not fun. Nobody wants to talk to you. You don't relate to regular people. Uh, I didn't relate to kids. I didn't play any. I, it was weird. And so, but then I found myself writing a sentence, and I think everybody should journal and write, that said that was in public. And then something I've never revealed to myself until this morning, so you're the first people to hear this. Let's hear is it. That at home, I was treated like a princess. My mom and dad adored me. They loved me. They understood me. I didn't have to explain who I was. My dad was bigger and geeky than I was. We built a computer when I was eight years old. We did magic tricks. We used to take apart and tinker with things. And we were geeky together, and that was okay. Uh, but they loved me. And they were also kind of weird. They, none of us had a lot of friends. We were this really tight-knit, crazy family. We talked on the CB radio. We used to shoot guns in the garage. I mean, we did really crazy stuff. That's fun. And so, but I spent a lot of time trying to make them happy. One of the things I also revealed, and I do think that you have to do some uncovery. If your journey is to figure out who you are and your place in this world, and if you want to help others, you do have to put your mask on first. And when I was four years old, my younger sister had just been born. My mom was an only child uh, of immigrants from Russia. Her dad was a butcher. Her mom was five foot two, this tiny little thing who, from what I understand, I don't really remember her. She was a bookie. She raised bulldogs and she was in the diamond industry. Okay. This, can you imagine this spunky little, this woman? And my mom, they didn't have a lot of money. My mom was five foot nine and she slept on the couch. She never had her own bedroom. She was an only child. Okay. I walk into the bedroom and I'm four years old. My grandma and I shared a bedroom and my grandma was gone. She passed away in her sleep. And I remember my mom, with this newborn and this really precocious four-year-old, crying. And I am start to cry, but I remember my mom cried a lot. We used to go to the cemetery and visit her parents and she would cry. She was never as happy as she was before they passed away. And she always used to romanticize that my grandma died of a broken heart because my dad, grandpa had just died of leukemia. Mm. So I actually think I spent most of my life trying to make my mom happy because I love them so much. And we grew up in the kitchen. And one of the problems with that is everything in our world was about food. We ate. We ate when we were happy. We ate when we were sad. And then I started to write down what we ate. Okay, here's the typical day growing up of food. And when I grew up, it was sugar, frosted flakes and milk, yep. maybe some bacon, uh, a glass of orange juice, which is also just sugar. Then you had lunch. Lunch was a bologna sandwich on white bread with a snack of some sort, like a yodel. Oh my God, we love yodels. What is a yodel? A yodel is like wrapped chocolate with crap in the, I mean, it's so bad. Then I'd come home, <laughs> always have chocolate cookies, you chocolate with cookies and milk, which we would dunk. Then dinner was like chicken fried cutlets, mashed potatoes, canned beans, and dessert, because we loved you. Well, we loved you to the point, my mom was 260 pounds, I had huge thighs. And then when we went out, we would go to the newly, McDonald's was just in town. Nice. Oh my God, the milkshake and the fries and the Big Mac. And then we would do Arby's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, extra crispy, an entire bucket. I'm sorry. There's not an ounce of nutrition in my childhood. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, except maybe a piece of fruit or watermelon once in a while. But I don't know how I even survived. And I will tell you, if you're in, if you've got young kids in school and they're acting up or they're misbehaving or they seem to be ADD, guess what? Knock off the sugar. It is, comes down to diet. 
And it took me a very, very long time. Obviously, I'm very committed to that. I've got a new book coming out with Jack Lane about juicing and health. But it's been my mission. My parents have both gone for 20 years, and I'm still trying to make them happy. So that was your discovery while you were journaling, is that you're, you're still trying to make your parents happy? Is that the discovery? Oh, I, I actually, the discovery was the details. I always knew that part. Oh, okay. I didn't really understand the difference. I'm an odd, awkward introvert. And this is not a joke. It is what keeps me from a lot of things. I don't, people invite me to things I don't tend to go. Um, I go when it's important. I'll do red carpets. I love to speak in front of people. Obviously my Facebook, you go, wow, she's outgoing and she looks a certain way. That's not really who I am. That is who I have to be to function sometimes. That's very interesting because there might be people out there who are listening right now saying, you know, she does all this stuff. So she, you know, that's why she's out there and that's why she's so popular and all this stuff. But that's not really you, but you're doing that for what purpose? Well, here's what I've learned. I'm at a certain age, okay? I, and I have to keep admitting this. And I have to tell you, every time I say it out loud, I look around going, she has to be lying. But I am six months away from 60 years old. And I know. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I look good for 45 or 50. I look fucking amazing for 60. Oh, yeah. But it, it, it is becoming more and more reality. I, I almost don't want to say the age because everyone got this weird stigma about it. I do, too. If you told me you were 60, I go, wow, that's old. So I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel about this or how society makes you feel, especially as a woman. But I got to come to reality and go, that is the, this age, this number. And congratulations for fixing enough in my life to look like this at this age. And is it now my responsibility? And I feel that it is. In public, have gotten to a certain amount of fame and success to give back and inspire everybody else. Because if you're suffering like me, and I know you are, I know you are. I know it's like when the door closes and there's nobody to love you or that you have dreams of being something or your heart got broken or you didn't get a job or you got fired or nobody loves you. And I'll tell you what, what we're seeing in society right now is people who are taking out guns and going, fuck you, I'm going to kill you because they can't handle it anymore. I understand. And I'll tell you what, life will push you to those points. I don't know that it means to or doesn't mean to, but it doesn't matter. Here's a couple of things that I've learned. And maybe I get to the Elaine's age, 93 years old, but I'm going to start spouting this stuff forever because you learn universal lessons that you do not know in your 20s. You certainly don't know them when you're my kid's age at 16. But you do when you get to a certain point where you have more years behind you than you do ahead of you. That's pretty much a guarantee. Unless I'm going to be 120 years old, I have more years behind me. And so now I understand what we all are looking for. There is a level of self-acceptance that you have to find. And there's a lot of ways to find it. But if you find your truth, life is better. If you find people who talk to you, don't lie to you, you got to really surround yourself with people who matter. There are too many people who won't. Nobody gives a, and I hate, I also use really bad language, and I'm sorry. I don't, I don't even like it when it comes out of somebody else, but nobody gives a fuck about you. They don't. You know how much they care about you? You're going to die, and you're going to get a mention on Facebook. A couple of people are going to go RIP, and then they won't remember tomorrow unless they actually really loved you. So what are you doing here? How much time do you have? How much fun can you have? And so for me, I have a lot of fun standing on stages. I have a lot of fun acting. I'm gonna go do back more of that because I miss that. I have a lot of fun watching my kids grow up. Um, you gotta enjoy this life as if it was the only one that you've got. Now, there's a couple of things that I hear people say and they're wrong. Everything does not happen for a reason. That would mean that somebody's up there with a scorecard going, she's going to do that. No, no, no. Things happen. You find the reason. Make up a reason why it happened. And wait, then make wait a, hold on. So things happen and you find the reason. Yeah, it's not what happened for me. No, no, no. It happened. Wow. That is because I set something in motion that those coincidences, I met this person because take some responsibility for the good and the bad. And keep in the back of your head my voice that says, life happens for you, not to you. Right. Bad things will happen to you. People you love will die. You will break something. You will lose. It will. And shame on you if you walk around going, oh, why me? Why you? You've got to be kidding me. What do you mean, why you? I look at Pedro, who's in one of my videos with Spindrum. He had his legs, arms and legs amputated. If for a second he sat around going, why me? You know what he says? It happened. Now his reasoning is, he says he got a second chance in life and his job is now to inspire people and he has a massive platform. 
I have a girlfriend who's a midget. She is three foot two inches tall, okay? She walked around for the first part of her life going, why me? Why am I so different? Mm -hmm. I look at her and go, why not? Hey, girlfriend, everybody remembers you. You can't walk, and you're adorable and cute and fit. You walk into a room, they all know you. All of us who are trying to be famous would love that opportunity. <laughs> so let's start switching the messaging, the self-talk, and just get happier. So awesome. I love this. And you, now you weren't always famous and, and it wasn't always this way. Cause you, you, you mentioned you were you know, a chubby kid. And, um, when was it that you decided to branch out and to do something with your life and, and you put yourself out there? Cause as an introvert, it's not really like, it's not really something that is natural. So what, how'd you put yourself out there? You know I put myself out there because I always wanted to matter. Um, and it happened. I always wanted to be an actress. I would be very happy, it's what I wanted to be, Julia Roberts or Sandra Bullock. That career path looked really appealing to me. Uh, back then it was more like Audrey Hepburn or Catherine Hepburn. I just wanted, I wanted the camera, I wanted the fame, I, wanted the, I just wanted all of that. And also I wanted to act, I've been on movie sets. In fact, I, so I have acted in lots of movies. In fact, I got the lead in the first movie I auditioned for. But you backtrack to high school, and I wanted to be the pretty girl up there. I wanted to be the lead, I auditioned all the time, and I never got anything. Mm. I got talent person number three. I got chorus. I got the chick in the back. And my, I, I just wanted it so bad. And I actually, I remember my two high school girlfriends, and Casapini and Renee Polina, I love you. They could both sing. They were both pretty. And they always had the lead. And it was kind of, it was really sad. Like, I just wanted it. So I go off to college to be a lawyer, because that's what smart kids in my world, if you're either a doctor or a lawyer, I right. hated it. There was no option. Nobody mentioned, you know that I didn't know what the word CEO was until I was in my 30s. Mm. He worked for himself. He was an entrepreneur before that word even happened. He was an engineer who was 1099 everywhere. But I didn't know what co how companies were run. I was living in my own little bubble, okay? And so I auditioned and auditioned and auditioned. I'm in college, and I still love to act. I got a small two-character play that was an amazing experience. And it kind of went, see, I think you could do this, but... You know, but you didn't have, you don't have the social proof. So maybe you can't, maybe you could. Damn it. Senior year, everything changed. Because here's what I've done. I've always just tried. I've always leaped and let stuff happen. Okay? I don't know the outcomes. Looking back in my career, you go, that was an amazing career. Let's be real. Didn't plan any of it. Not any of it. In fact, I didn't plan last night. And last night, I get a phone call asking me to be in a celebrity cookbook tonight. Because the deadline's tomorrow. Like, literally somebody dropped out. Last night... This amazing woman called and said, I've got a celebrity cook with J.K. Virgin and some of other contemporaries. Can you put five of your favorite recipes with high-res pictures by tomorrow? So I grabbed a girlfriend of mine who's been a chef of mine that I've worked with. I said, you know what? We got a job. She came over at 10 o'clock last night. Tonight we're cooking. The cameras are there. You'll watch it on Instagram Live because I have a habit of just going, yes, throw your hat over the ring and figure out how to do it later. Most of you go, I don't know how. I don't, you don't know how to go to the bathroom. You don't know how to speak or dance or drive, you learn all of it before you stop learning that phrase, I don't know. Who cares what you know? Just go do it. Yeah. So senior year, senior year, I'm like, I don't want to be a lawyer. I know that at this point. I'm like, shit, the, 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 the boat is left. My guess, my, you know, my parents paid a lot of money for college. And I auditioned for the big senior play. Because for me, it was just what I did, right? And by the way, here's how painful this is. I can't sing, okay? I would always audition for the musical. It was so painful to even hear me sing, but I just wanted it. So I auditioned for Shakespeare's As You Like It. I'm not that good in English. I, I'm just not. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. I get up there, I audition, I go to look at the call board, and I'm looking at the bottom, which is where I always live. And there's townsperson and little character, little character, and know my name. Oh. I'm like, very top. The role of Rosalind, two and a half hours on stage playing the most amazing character Shakespeare ever wrote for a woman. And there's my name. Woo! Oh my God. Well, but the first reaction was like, um, I have to go talk to the director because I, I uh, why would he do that? I know that sounds really stupid, right? <laughs> so I go to Professor David Richmond. I'm like, hey, um, he's my acting teacher. And I'm like, you got to explain this to me. I'm not going to just replace my whole life. This is my senior year, and I just got the lead. And what I think is, one of, I don't even know if I can do it. And he sat me down. And he said, look, he said, you have so much depth. So much passion, so much empathy, so much pain. So, I mean, he went on and on. And I'm listening to him as though he's talking about somebody else. And I'm like, wow. And then I looked at David Richmond. And here's the thing about him was he's 100% legally blind. 
he couldn't see me. He couldn't see all the exterior stuff that stopped people from seeing. You know what he saw? He saw the real me. The part that you could only hear if you just like listen to your ears and close your eyes for somebody. And I will tell you, I did a show. It got rave reviews. It was enough impetus, and this is what you all need to hear. It was one person believing in me that I said, Mom, I love you, but I'm going to New York an actress. Oh my God, that was a huge thing to say. I did, I didn't know where I was gonna live. I got, I, who knows what I did. I was a very scrappy kind of girl. I got the lead in the very first movie I auditioned for, Splatter University, which is still now a cult classic. I got more films. I am up in um, Broadway and soap operas. And it all had its own stuff. Because by the way, the other issue was that I was still fighting my weight during that time. Even though I'm on Broadway with Christopher Reeve, they made me go to Overeaters Anonymous. So even though I got stuff, I always, it was always like this double-edged sword to the point where like, am I an imposter? Am I really working and deserving all of this, you know? Well, so what was it like when you um, told your mom, like, I, you know, I'm a senior in college, going to be a lawyer, and then now all of a sudden everything, you're know, changing, moving to New York. And so what was that like to tell your mom about that? Because a lot of people have that fear. Like, I don't want to go against my parents or whatever. And you, you know, said that you're always wanting to please your parents or, you know, get your parents love. So what was that like to tell her? And you went ahead and did it and you made something of it. Here's what you got to understand. You cannot read somebody else's mind. You have no idea what somebody else is thinking. I have one of my coaching clients and he was in his forties and he had not told his mom that he was gay and he was freaking out about coming out of the closet. And we're all looking at him in class thinking, you know, it's not a real secret because you're kind of flaming. Um, you look at And he's like, I don't know if I can tell my parents I'm gay. And I'm like, you think she might know? Huh? But he hadn't told her. And he was terrified of that. And I coached him to actually tell her. Same thing with my parents. When I told them, even though they, oh my God, I'm going to start to cry. See, even I, ugh, it was a big deal for me because they never wanted me to be a lawyer in the first place. They didn't care. They just wanted me to be happy. And they were like, go for it. We love you. We're going to support whatever you do. So in my head, I built up the whole story that was never real. And they gave me their blessing. And I mean, it was, it was bizarre. And I'm sure it was like for Malcolm's moms. Like, of course I know you're gay, honey. Go live your life. Why would I want you to be unhappy? So um, they just were supportive. They were the most amazing supportive people in the world. I don't know why I would have thought any different. So I've learned a lot of lessons about me in this journey. And that's one of the things I highly recommend you guys. Couple of things. Go to seminars. There's this thing out there called seminars. I didn't know until I went to my first one at 31. And it doesn't matter what one you go to, find something that's right for you. I was so uh, obsessed about money because we had none. My dad spent three years in the hospital. He had a horrible industrial accident. And so money has been a kind of an issue for me. And so this first seminar, one of my friends said, you know what? My, my, I was at a party. He called me and said, my friends don't like you. I was 31. And I said to him, why do I care what your friends think? And he's like, wow, I may not get, you know, you're, you, anyway. So he said, there's this seminar. And I'm like, oh, right. And it was $400 back in a long time ago. Dang, that's a lot of money back then. <laughs> well, you know, for some people, it's still a lot of money. You can't discount. Yeah. And so I'm like, I, I, I didn't want to spend it. And here's the thing. You've got to invest in yourself. But unless you do it, you'll never know. And those of us who are successful have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. The more famous somebody is, the more wealthy you know they've had some pretty serious training. And by the way, think about how much you invest in college and that degree got me nothing, okay? So he said to me, unbelievable, I don't even remember his name and if he's listening and he remembers who I am, you should reach out to me. Um, he said, I'll pay for you. Okay, I had such limiting beliefs. This is why I coached you to talk out of your limiting beliefs because I had them. I thought, oh great, he's gonna wanna sleep with me. Because in my brain, nobody gives you anything for free without expecting something in return. That was never the case. In fact, I never really saw him again. It was just his gift, his generosity, and he had a different relationship with money. That meant nothing to him. Kind of like me giving somebody 10 bucks. But I didn't know that at that time. I went to this and it was life changing. I mean, it was absolutely, in fact, here's the, if you want the real story, because I think it's very inspiring. I did the training for five days. Oh my God, I heard things in this class. It was unbelievable. Then on the way out, they tried to upsell you the advanced class, okay? Which was $900. I get on the phone with him and I'm like, see, I told you, they're always just trying to sell you something. No, that was my limiting belief that came from my parents. They, in fact, if you don't enroll and go to things, you're never going to learn how good they are, and yes, you get to pay for them. So he said, 
I'm not going to pay for this. Didn't you have a great five days? I'm like, oh my God, it was amazing. He said, then what, what, what's the problem? So I'm still dealing with issues. You have to understand and acknowledge your own issues. He said, all right, but I will do something for you because this class, this class is the class. I'm like, all right, fine. He said, I'll give you a loan. You make the terms. So it was $900. I said, how about $100 a month, no interest? He said, done. Okay, here's what I want to tell you guys. The Saturday night of that training still remains one of the top five nights of my entire life. Now go back, if I hadn't done this, if I, one of the top five nights of my entire life was the Saturday night of what happened in that training. It is one reason that I teach my Forbes Factor training now, because I know how profoundly my, my entire trajectory of my life changed at that moment because of something that this class did for me. I actually do a training and I do this for other people because it's so precious, it's so spectacular. And I, I, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but I will tell you very clearly, I would not be here or anywhere near here if I hadn't done that. So what's the lesson that you learn? I'm, and by the way, the first five that you may go to may not even work for you. Who cares? There is something out there. But if you mm -hmm. stop looking and stop investing in you, in fact, if you're in a different profession aside from entrepreneur, they always have continuing ed classes. If you're a physical therapist, if you are a, it doesn't matter what you are, you always have continuing ed. Let me tell you something. As an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, as a human being, Continuing ed is learning about you. And that is really, really important. That is so awesome. I had an event, somewhat like the same story. Uh, I paid for it though. And when I got to the event, I actually spent the first two and a half days in my room, my hotel room, because I was so scared to go down there. But then I finally showed up after two and a half days and within the first four hours, now that event was $7,500. So it was a very pricey event, you know, for, for some for events. And that first four hours, I got way more than that $7,500. Like my whole entire shift of myself, of who I am, who I walk around as, you know, who I'm being, totally yeah, changed. Wait, 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 wait. I'm on a podcast and actually just want to say hello to the love of my life. My hello. So this is Joshua. <laughs> He's and I'm going to tell you that I found, are we in love? <laughs> He's in training for Mr. Universe at the moment. Whoop, whoop. And I only found him and found love because I got clear. I figured out what I wanted. I let go of things that weren't working and I held on way too long. And I got to tell you, if you're willing to risk and own who you are, what's on the other side of that rainbow is unbelievable, okay? Unbelievable. It really is. And I know we're, we're really short on time, Forbes, so I wanna, what I wanna do is, you said that there were three things that you want people to do, and this is the Women Action Takers podcast, and so the last question I always ask is, what's one action step that our audience can take today, tomorrow, or next week that's going to propel them either personally or professionally? Now, you already gave us the one, which was seminars, so do you wanna give us the other two really quick? And can I be really self-serving? I don't know many women who teach a seminar like I do. So my seminar is called www.forbesfactorlive. Uh, life changing, especially if you've had a trauma in your life, if you hurt, raped, molested, screwed over, there is something here. If something's holding you back, I don't know anyone. And Linda, you know me. I don't know anyone else who teaches this. I only do it four times a year, and it's a very small group. So people who get in the room with me, we're going to keep that going as long as I can. The second thing is you have to know what you want. And I'm sorry that we're short on time because I'll do an exercise. There's a clarity. If you can know what you want, you can truly manifest it. When I wanted Joshua and I finally got clear on what I wanted in a partner in life, I was actually brazen enough to write down that I wanted someone who looked like he walked off the cover of a romance novel. You know, I didn't go on Tinder. I didn't do a dating app. I didn't go to a bar. I just wrote it down. And in my own crazy vision, he knocked on my door of my hotel room to be a spin gym model, okay, for the product that I love. And he changed my entire life because I wanted it, okay? And then the last thing, and I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna be self-serving here because your friends and people are gonna give you a lot of advice. I'm the only one who can give you this. I don't have a whole lot of time for the gym. I want an amazing body. I have rock hard abs. Those are not my abs at the table, but it gotta laugh, right? <laughs> but I do have amazing, sexy arms that I never had before this. And so my little spin gym, and I know I gave you one and I give it to, I mean, it's a, it's a $40 investment, seriously. If you do this three times a day for one song, your life, your arms, your body, your attitude, your energy will be aligned with what you want. 
I don't need you to go to the gym or go for a job. This is the only thing I know that doubles your heart rate. So it's a huge self-promotion, but I didn't invent it, okay? The Chinese did 2,000 years ago. When I touched it, and I actually touched it in silver, when I found this thing, my life bulb went up and my life changed. The fact that I now created it, promote it, sell it, whatever it is I do with it, it's because when I touched it, I said, oh my God, there's nothing like this. I didn't need to do that. And I'll tell you what, Linda, I stopped a lot of my life to promote this product for people who are in wheelchairs, in office, super fit, not super fit, any age. That is the dream product. And I'm happy to talk to anybody. I have a, I'm actually, I actually do Zoom calls. I just want people to understand and know what this is. Because if you found something so wonderful, wouldn't you want to share it too? Definitely, definitely. Well, I want to thank you so much. And it's what's interesting is you've done a lot of sales, product sales and stuff, you know, online doing the, like the, the infomercial type of thing. And it's amazing because what I finally have realized after years, because I had money issues as well, is that if we're not telling people about what we have, then they're not going to know about it. And so when you said self-serving, it's really not self-serving because it's the opposite, right? Because if you don't introduce it to them, they're not going to know about it and it's not going to be able to change their life. So it's really about them. Sales is about them and them purchasing the product, right? Yeah. Thank you so no, much. Yeah. By the way, I love you. I know you've got to go. I bless, you know, just need to take a second here, Miss Sunshine. Yes. You are an incredibly hardworking woman who also needs a little bit more love and to be washed over. Because I think that you are trying so hard. You drove two and a half hours up to do an interview with me, and I don't know if I said thank you enough. And I think that you get to go, wow, how amazing are you and the journey that you're on? And I just want to take a moment, honor you, and thank you. Thank you. That uh, brings tears to my eyes. Thank you so much. I, I know I'm working my ass off, you know, trying to make all this stuff happen and, and making all this stuff happen, not trying, making all this stuff happen. And here's the secret. If you work your ass off, you've got no place else to sit down, so be careful. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a little sit upon. <laughs> well, I adore you and I love what your mission is. Keep going. And you know what? Here's the thing, baby girl. There is no end. It is just the journey. So you got to enjoy it. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, Forbes. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to invite you to an event that I want you to speak at. So I'll tell you about it soon. Let's do it. All right, baby girl. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Mwah. Mwah. Bye, Joshua. <laughs> I kind of like you. Wow. That was an awesome show. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends and family and give us a five-star review. While you're at it, please subscribe. The Women Action Takers podcast is always looking for amazing women action takers just like you to be interviewed. If you're interested in being on the podcast, see the link in the show notes. See you next time.